I want to talk about the work that I'm doing uh, to address two major problems that we're facing as humanity, the need for energy and the impact that our use of energy is having on the environment. Back in 2002, 2003 time frame, the Nobel Prize laureate Richard Smalley did a study. He wanted to identify the top 10 problems that face humanity, and he ranked energy as number one. And he justified that by explaining that by solving the energy problem, you'd be able to solve all of the other problems on the list. So what about the energy problem? Well, the United States presently uses about close to 25% of the world's energy. About one-fourth of the energy produced in the world is used here. But we're only about 5% of the population. That may seem like the problem, but it's really not. It's an indication of the problem. The real problem, if you look at this list here, uh, all of the developed uh, countries uh, use more energy than percentage of population. It's really a reflection of standard of living, quality of life. The challenge we have is that when you look at um, the top of the list up there, you'll see China and India. Those two countries represent together about 40% of the world's population, yet they're using less energy uh, than their percentage population. That's where the challenge is. As those countries start to lift their populations out of poverty and continue their industrialization, they're going to start consuming more and more energy. And we're already seeing the price of gasoline rising, oil. Uh, there's going to be more competition for that energy. And of course, the impact that it has on, it, on the environment will continue to expand. Automobiles is, uh, represent one of the areas of uh, large consumption of energy, but also large consumption or, or large production, rather, of pollution. Uh, CO2 gases that are destroying our environment. In fact, there are about 80 million cars manufactured every year in the world. And as those countries start to evolve and continue to improve the quality of life of their citizens, those numbers are going to get even larger. To put it into perspective, clearly, as the, uh, we use more gasoline, pr produce more CO2 to the environment, um, we're going to produce more pollution. Ideally, we would transition to a different kind of um, energy source, such as electric vehicles. To put that into perspective, 80 million cars produced every year. The battery for the Tesla Model S costs about $50,000. So you're talking about an economic impact of about $4 trillion in batteries every year. That's a mind-boggling impact. Clearly, we have to have a better battery technology if we're going to make electric vehicles possible. Uh, this picture reminds me of Carl Sagan back in the 80s in the original Cosmos series. <laughs> um, the question was, I wonder when the dinosaurs looked up if they understood what was happening to them. We see the impact to the environment of our use of fossil fuels every day. We're constantly reminded of it. But we need to get our perspective on how we're going to proceed to address the problem so that we don't go the way of the dinosaur. <laughs> Between 1970 and 1999, we spent about $7 trillion on oil. We literally have been exporting our wealth. Uh, between 1970 and 1999, we actually had uh, about three uh, uh, oil price spikes. Some of you might remember the 73 oil embargo. And each one of those pri price spikes was followed by economic recession. If you fast forward to since 2000, we actually went to war in Iraq over oil. And during that time, we had a price spike in oil. It was followed by a recession. That led to the housing collapse. And we're still in a tailspin in the process of recovering from that. So all of this over oil, clearly, we have the ability to solve this problem. And military solutions are not necessarily the right solution, and clearly not the right solution, because they're not a permanent solution. We can't uh, deprive other uh, citizens and other people of the world of resources that, need, that they need to prosper as well. And, at, and the military solution obviously does not address anything to do with the environment. We know how to address this problem. Back in the 60s, I remember as a kid watching President Kennedy in 1962 when he said we were going to put a man on the moon before the decade is out. He said we don't know how to do this yet. We don't have materials that we need. We have, don't have the experience of having, to doing this, having done this, but we're going to do it anyway. 
And by 1969, we had man setting foot on the moon. What we need is determination to solve the problem. When I was a kid, <laughs> I used to watch, uh, <laughs> uh, some of you might remember these robots uh, from Lost in Space and the other one from Robbie the Robot. I used to watch these robots on TV. I wanted my own robot. So I decided to build myself a robot. It took me over a year to build him. Uh, then after I got it completed, the, the problem I had was that nobody told me that the other robots that I was watching had people inside. <laughs> but I didn't know any better than to try. <laughs> um, later on, this is one of my earlier patents. Um, it, um, used, it, it's, it's a technology or an invention that uses um, uh, digital encoded scales that have been photographically reduced and a magnifying lens and a photo sensor to read binary coded information from that scale. This is the base technology for CDs and, and DVDs. I got this patent back in 1979. I call it the big fish that got away. Well, I was having, <laughs> I was having fun working on spacecraft. Um, I was working on the Galileo project, which is presently in orbit around Jupiter. I have an invention on that spacecraft. I worked on Mars Observer, Voyager program, the Cassini mission to Saturn. Uh, so I, I was enjoying my day job. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Eventually, I was working on a new type of heat pump. The idea here was to add, come up with a new type of engine, that, or heat pump rather, that did not use Freon, which, because Freon's bad for the environment. I wanted to use water as a working fluid instead. As I was experimenting with this engine, or this, this, this uh, heat pump, I built some nozzles and I shot a stream of water across the bathroom, and I thought, geez, this would make a neat water gun. So I put the heat pump aside. I figured that if I could make, I was having trouble getting people to finance and support this hard science stuff that I wanted to do. So I figured if I got some money make from a toy, something anybody could appreciate, then I could have the money to go off and do my own products. And so I did. So the that invention led to the water gun, okay? <laughs> this is the super soaker. That eventually led to super soakers like this. <laughs> and I do have the first prototype here. <laughs> now, pe people know me for the super soaker, but what they don't know is that I'm responsible for the success of the Nerf dart gun line as well. <laughs> you, you got, I assume you're all familiar with Nerf. Some of you, you're not. <laughs> so needless, needless to say, I've been able to move forward with my hard science stuff, and I'm going to talk to you <laughs> about some of that today. I'm working on a new type of engine and a new battery that will address the environmental problems that I was talking about. These, you know, the, um, one of the things that have happened along the way, I was anointed by Time Magazine as one of the top inventor, 10 inventors in the world. I'm sorry, by the top, yeah, top inventors in the world. And my engine was actually, actually identified as one of the top 10 world-changing innovations. So back to the problem. I felt I'm qualified to solve this problem, so I don't know any better, just like with the robot, I don't know any better than try. <laughs> so I like this chart as an engineer. When you look at it, just it makes your eyes pop. But when you think about it, it's a really, really elegant chart. On the left side of the chart, it shows all of the energy sources coming into the, the United States. There's solar, there's a hydro, wind, natural gas, coal, petroleum. And it shows where those energy sources go and what they're used for. There's power generation, the industrial, transportation. The key here is that. Most of the petroleum goes into transportation. The bottom line is on the right side of the chart. About 37% of the energy available in these sources actually does useful things. About 58% of it is rejected as waste heat. Our ability to convert those energy sources into useful work is, is limited. So I came up with the idea of developing an engine that would be more efficient than existing engines. So if you could imagine an engine that would be more efficient than existing engines, would be able to convert heat directly into electricity. So if you had a solar uh, uh, system and be able to convert heat from the sun 
directly into electricity and do it more efficiently than any existing engine, we could re and do it at a cost, which is a key element uh, that um, is competitive with coal and natural gas, then we'd be able to eliminate our dependence on fossil fuels that are destroying our environment. So I set out to build this engine, um, and this is my engine. It's called a JTEC. It's a, it converts heat directly into electricity. And if you look at it, it's the really, I like this chart too, as an engineer. <laughs> but I'm going to describe it. What's going on here, there are two membrane electrode assemblies similar to what's used in a fuel cell. Um, and in a fuel cell, you have proton conductive membranes, which is what you have here. But in a fuel cell, you also have oxygen and you have hydrogen reacting with oxygen to produce water. There's no oxygen and no water in this system. There's only hydrogen, and the hydrogen circulates in the engine continuously in a loop, and it's never used or consumed. Uh, I have two stacks. One is at low temperature and the other one at high temperature. And the, the low temperature stack is used to compress hydrogen, and you supply that compressed hydrogen to the high temperature stack where the hydrogen expands from high pressure back to low pressure. And you're supplying heat during that high temperature expansion. And what happens is you produce more energy during the high temperature expansion than it takes during the, to keep the low temperature compression going. And you end up with net electricity coming out to a load. This engine operates on a cycle that is equivalent to what's called a Connaught cycle, which means that theoretically it's more efficient than any engine that's been built so far. And it has no moving mechanical parts. So, with that engine, we'd be able to use it to collect energy from the sun and produce electricity directly. And that electricity then, and produce it, by the way, more efficiently than solar cells so that the cost of the electricity would be competitive with fossil fuels. 